Hi there, welcome to IndyCar on Sunday, the whatever it is today. What is it today? The 20th? Sorry about this, folks. It's my usual nonsensical approach to dates. Oh, the 21st, okay. <laughs> so the 21st of August. Sorry I've been absent for a while. Uh, I had a number of health issues last week and a couple of family issues and events that I needed to attend to out with work time. So sorry if I've not been around for the last few days, but I'm back now with more news. Now, first of all today, um, Nicola Sturgeon has been quoted quite widely across social media in the last 24 hours saying that um, the United Kingdom looks like it intends to uh, take back centralised control over Scotland if we don't vote for independence that there is a not just a risk of this happening but both Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak are talking about Scotland as Sunak characterised it evolving back into the United Kingdom. Now if you ever check the definitions of the words devolution and evolution you'll find that they refer to completely different things. Devolution is the movement of decision making power away from the centre towards the people, and this happens regularly in countries all over the world. Evolution, on the other hand, if you look at the dictionary definition, says that it is the, the change in heritable characteristics um, across a biological population. Now that means people actually evolving uh, and changing over time due to inherited characteristics. Now I would say actually that uh, if Sunak wishes to characterise Scotland as evolving in political terms, then we're evolving away from the Union, not towards it, because to evolve towards the Union would be a regressive step in our characteristics, not a positive one. However, what Nicola Sturgeon was saying was quite true, that if the Tories um, stay in charge and we don't vote to end uh, the Union, then what will happen is the Tories will eventually simply make devolution a thing of the past. They've already uh, expressed their desire to get rid of the Scottish Parliament. They never wanted it in the first place. They have consistently Consistently tried to belittle it and to infantilise it all the way through its existence through people like um, Ruth Davidson, for example, who tried basically to make a mockery of the whole thing. But the people of Scotland like their parliament, they want it to stay, and the only way for it to stay, as Nicola says, is for it to become entrenched by becoming independent. Now, to be fair, we're not actually becoming independent because we are we haven't been subsumed by anybody. We haven't been uh, what's the word? We haven't been invaded in the true sense of the word and taken over. They have tried to do that. But of course we're not actually uh, part of the United Kingdom. We are a separate nation. We have been for thousands of years, for hundreds of years certainly, and uh, going back to at least the 800s uh, when Scotland was unified. So we have a long history of being an independent state and we are still an independent state who have a treaty with another independent state called England. So we don't actually have to secede at all. And independence is not about secession in our case. It's about simply ending a treaty with another country. And we can always replace that treaty with some other trading deal later on if we want. Especially since the uh, British government has been, especially the, I would say the Tory party particularly, have been making all sorts of noises about building canals and pipelines so that Scotland's water can be siphoned off first of all to Wales and then fed to the, the rest of England, which is obviously parched and drought stricken at the moment. So the plans that the Tories have for Scotland do not involve democracy in any way, shape or form. They, they just want to simply rule us from England and to hell with devolution. But of course devolution is not evolution as I've said and devolution is a halfway house and it's not as good as being completely free from the Union because Scotland cannot take the critical decisions that it needs to take in order to protect everybody from the coming uh, price hikes in energy and price hikes in food. All, all of these things that are happening to us at the moment are nothing to do with decisions taken by the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government or the SNP or anybody else in Scotland. These are all to do with decisions taken by the Tory party and its government in England. If it were not for the Tory party in England, then Ofgem would have placed a price cap on the cost of energy at the inflation rate, which currently is exceeding 10%, not the 400% rise that we're looking at at the moment. We're looking at basically our bills rising in October from somewhere in the region of 1,200 maybe pounds a year 
all the way up to four and a half thousand pounds by the time we reach the winter this this uh, this coming year. Not to mention the fact that we've got massive food inflation. All prices are rising at the moment. Petrol prices, although they have started to come back down a little bit, are still being kept artificially high. So the cost of living is going to be the major driving force behind Scotland's um, drive to rid itself of the toxic union. So, of course, this, as I've said, the stakes have never been higher. And, of course, the um, what's pushing people towards independence now is not so much political uh, activity as economic activity or the lack of it, the lack of money in people's pockets, the rising prices, the rising taxation, the lowering standards of living, and the fact that people's wages cannot keep up with these massive price rises. Now, the only way in which Scotland can control its energy prices, and again, Nicholas Sturgeon has said this quite explicitly, is to re-nationalise the utilities in Scotland so that our energy bills are not controlled by some uh, private companies operating in some globalised market. They're actually decided by our government, and they own the energy resources. In other words, the means of production. That means things like our renewable energy arrays, our offshore wind farms, and also our gas supplies. These ought to be under the control of the country, not private companies. But of course, the British government has given it all away. We need to take it back. We can't do that if we are still tied to a UK union which insists on giving away Scotland's natural resources to their buddies in big business. Now, speaking of big business brings me to the next item of news, which I have to be honest, had passed me by. There was very little media fanfare, of course, given to this by the British state media. But one of Scotland's two um, satellite launcher companies, the two companies that concerned incidentally are Orbex, which are based in Forest, I believe, uh, in Murray, and the other one is uh, Skyrora, who I'm going to talk about today. Now, I'm very much more familiar with Skyrora, having been involved and witnessed some of their testing before. But I can tell you now that Skyrora is inching closer and closer to being the first Scottish company to launch a Scottish-built rocket from a Scottish launch site in to orbit with the, um, the successful firing of the second stage engines from their uh, Skylark XL rocket. Now this was performed recently at Macrahanish, which has now been opened as a space centre called Discover, I think it's called Discover Space. And of course Macrahanish is an ideal place for doing things like dangerous rocket testing <laughs> because there are not too many people around and there is an airfield there and it's an ex-Ministry of Defence and also an ex, uh, I think it's an ex-United uh, States air base as well at one time from World War II. So it's a terrific place to fire these rockets. Now Skyrora has already uh, test fired the main engines of their rocket. They've also test fired the third stage engine of their rocket, which I witnessed myself several years ago. This is the last piece in the jigsaw puzzle of test firings before this rocket is launched. Now I understand they've also um, applied to the Civil Aviation Authority for a launch license, which means they're getting closer and closer to being ready to fire this rocket and to send a test payload into Earth orbit. So this is an historic moment. But not only that, but Skyrora has now just opened in July the very first rocket factory in the central belt of Scotland. And they've opened their office and a rocket factory in Cumbernauld. Almost an ideal place, really, for such an, uh, a fantastic new venture. Skyrora is, uh, I would say, it's an international uh, company because it is part Scottish and part Ukrainian, which is a kind of odd mix. But the founding, uh, the CEO of Skyrora, uh, Volodymyr, he, he actually is Ukrainian. And some of the components for Skyrora's rockets are made in Ukraine, and some of the rest of the components are made here in Scotland, and the rockets are assembled here and will be launched here. So it's interesting that two countries both being um, <laughs> struggling with larger, uh, more aggressive neighbours, shall we say, have got together and decided that they're going to create a new space programme. Now, I'm not leaving Orbex out of this either, by the way, because Orbex is also a Scottish company and they are getting ready to launch as well. So there is a miniature space race going on within the Scottish space industry just now between two indigenous Scottish launch companies. It'll be exciting to see which one of them gets there first, but it doesn't really matter who gets there first. 
first. The main thing is that hopefully the two first Scottish-based launcher companies will get uh, an object into orbit before anyone else in the UK has managed to do so. And I think this is an important thing to remember, that co companies like SpaceX and Orbex are investing in Scotland, even though at the moment we're not independent. But I know for a fact that when we do become independent, companies like Orbex and like Skyrora will be getting a lot more funding from the Scottish Government to expand the space industry and to expand space operations around the north coast of Scotland. There are three or perhaps even four potential launch sites around the Scottish coastlines and islands, particularly in places like Shetland, Orkney, Sutherland, and also on the west coast of Scotland as well. So there is a lot to be done in Scotland and it's all good news. And most of us didn't know anything about this because the BBC doesn't want to tell you anything about this good news and so it never really appeared anywhere. Okay, you'll also know that there was a massive rally and march uh, in Inverness over the last weekend. And as far as I can understand it, over 3,000 people participated in this march and rally in Inverness, of course, accompanied by the traditional noise of the Yes Bikers. Now, it's, uh, it's also planned for there to be many more marches and rallies across Scotland all the way through the next year, maybe more, um, leading up, we hope, to a final vote on independence next year, however that happens. And it's very important for the people who support independence to make their presence felt, especially when the media is running a complete blackout on news of anything to do with independence. The only way to get our message out there is to actually be out on the streets and showing the rest of the Scottish people that there is massive support for this. If you cannot have control over your media, the only way that you can communicate the message to people is directly. Now, yes, we have, well, I suppose people like myself who are broadcasting on social media, and that is very important. But I can only give you news and information as I get it. But what's more important is for you to get out there on the streets and talk to people, talk to your neighbours. Tell them about what is going on in Scotland. Tell them about what good things are coming uh, up in Scotland and why it's very important that this time, when they get the chance to vote on independence, they vote for it. Because at the moment, the biggest risk to Scotland's economy is not from becoming independent. It's from staying in the UK. And we all know that Sunak and Truss are going to basically uh, dissolve devolution completely and get rid of the Scottish Parliament entirely so that we never have a chance to vote on this ever again. This is our last chance. Even Nicola Sturgeon admitted that this is the time when we really need to vote to leave the UK Union because if we don't do it now, our Parliament will be swept away. Remember, our Parliament was set up under the auspices of the UK. OK, it was done reluctantly, grudgingly, because we were in the EU. But now that we're not in the EU, they'll be quite happy to bulldoze Holyrood completely and it will just become a distant memory. So this is the last chance we're going to get to do this. We all have to play a part, no matter how small it is and no matter what it is, even just simply talking to one person, one member of your family, one workmate, a neighbour, somebody in the street, somebody at the bus queue, and actually talking to them about this and saying, look, this is the time to do this. There is never going to be a better time, because if we don't do it, there is never going to be a worse time ahead of us than there is right now. It's time to escape. It's time to take back control of all of our resources, to renationalize those utilities so that we never again are faced with the extortion that is being visited upon us by a predatory international consortium of energy providers, because that is the problem. There's no regulation of the market in the UK, they are given a free reign to rip us off as much as they wish. And somewhere in the region of a third of Scottish families will be thrown into fuel poverty this winter simply because of the Tory party. If you don't want to be one of those families, then you need to vote for independence. And you need to talk to your friends, your relatives, even your children, your grandchildren, everybody about why it's necessary to do this. 
Anyway, I'm afraid that's it for me today, but I just wanted to make these three points today. And Nicola Sturgeon has acknowledged that the Scottish Parliament is now at risk of being demolished, being swept away by the Tories. We have good news coming from Scotland's space industry that there's going to be an expansion and a race to space from Scotland's two um, nascent space launch companies. And at the end of this, we still have the hope that there will be an independence referendum and that the people of Scotland, as they have done in Inverness, will come out in their thousands. Now, Inverness was a modest sized march. It is a bit of a distance for people to go to get to Inverness, but the fact that it has happened and thousands of people turned up give us all hope that the next time we have independence marches in Glasgow or Edinburgh, that there will be hundreds of thousands of people. Do you remember the times when we had marches in Glasgow where we had 100,000 or 150,000 people, 200,000 people? These days need to come back and we need to increase those numbers. And only you, that's you out there who's sitting watching this, can do that. So sign up and get along to the marches. Let's swell the numbers and make sure the people on the streets that we see and who see us marching know that this is going to happen and that it's not a myth and that just because the British media doesn't tell them about it does not mean it's not happening. I'll see you soon. Have a great weekend, or what remains of it, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.